Chapter 12 The rebuilt school had the same size but stronger, enhanced structure, making it look bigger. Soldiers and the villagers who were free from field duty were diligently attaching the thatch roof under the afternoon, unforgiving sun. Thien wiped the beads of sweat on his forehead because of the heat, even if he was sitting under the lush canopy. He was still feeling sore, he couldn't do much labor, and was only tying up the bunch of thatch with jod. The school was almost complete, but they still needed to wait for the equipment from the foundation in Bangkok. Kama Bing Lei said that they'd be lucky to get the supply before the new year. If not, it would take even two more weeks. He couldn't wait to teach his pupils and ask the stern captain to join them in kite competition one more time. Thien wrapped the tach bundles together and tied them with the bamboo core as Jod had taught him, feeling depressed. He should have asked for some more medicine from the doctor. Actually, his new heart didn't show any sign of resistance, so perhaps he could take the medication less frequently so they would last until the middle of the next month. By evening, after the other villagers and soldiers who came to help had already left, only two rangers remained on guard outside to see the teacher home. Thien's thin form was bending over and rummaging through the remaining items that survived the fire in the unfinished school, until he found what he was looking for. He grabbed a nail and picked up a hammer. He climbed on a small cabinet that stood at his waist to put the nail on a pole on a bamboo beam, and hung the calendar that bore the image of the king, burned at a corner as a reminder to his students when they looked up. The city boy slowly turned to look at his classroom from the height, thinking of the time he'd taught and played with his little pupils. He didn't know they could become so close in just two months. I don't want to leave. So, what he had to do was to try, no matter how risky it would be, to be able to be there as long as he could. Since the showdown with the illegal loggers, Days prior, the rangers were taking turn on guard to protect the daredevil volunteer teacher 24-7. They stood guard even at night around his hut, for fear that Master Sakta's goons might return to take revenge. Thien parted ways with the two rangers when he reached the route towards his accommodation. But once he got closer, he saw a movement inside his home, and his heart shuddered. He should have asked the two soldiers to walk with him until he reached the stairs. He looked for a good size of dry log to use as a weapon, and slowly crept up the stairs before shouting his warning. Who's there? When there was no answer, he peeked in to take a look. The log dropped from his hand, and he lunged forward at the someone with an utter alarm. Captain! He lunged towards the tall man who still wore a cast on his right arm with a supporter around his neck. The intense, dark, handsome face still looked ashen, yet the captain was in much better shape than the previous day. The thick lips tucked into a faint smile, the kind that made the younger man who came towards him with a smile on his face disappear. How come you got out of the hospital so soon? I thought it'd be a few more days. Thien raked his eyes over the wound that wasn't totally covered by the supporting cloth, worried. I have a task I need to finish. Captain's low tone sounded almost robotic. With the loggers? Captain Fufa fixed his eyes on the younger man's glistening brown eyes with an emptiness in his. He walked away towards the window and gazed aimlessly. The wealthy boy frowned, wondering why the captain's demeanor had shifted, as if they were mere strangers now. Before he asked, the tall officer spoke up first. Are you having fun being here? What? Thien blurted out his astonishment. Captain, are you okay? Did you have any brain trauma? Fufa was quiet for a long while. Then he slowly turned to face the younger man. 
If you had enough fun, then go home. What fun? I don't get it. Don't make your father more worried than he already is. That one single sentence sounded like a curse that had turned him into stone. Father. Everything was connected and became crystal clear. Dian balled his hands into a fist and gritted his teeth. How come you know about my father? The young captain held his words for a millisecond before answering in a plain, emotionless voice. Your father was my superintendent in the previous department. So you got an order to keep an eye on me, is that it? Then burst out his anger at the man who stood still like a statue. His heart quivered with hurt and disappointment. Fufa simply nodded, his face the picture of a deep exhaustion with all the chaos that had happened. Do you really think that a soldier like me had enough free time to teach someone how to boil water or wash the clothes? The cold indifference that seeped from the captain hurt more than all that sarcasm. Tian pressed his lips tight as he glared at Fufa, trying to find the truth within the deepest crevice of his heart. It was as if the other man had turned into a total stranger. Are you saying that if without the order you wouldn't have paid attention to me at all? Are you? Yes, you got that right. As the captain finished his words, Thien kicked a plastic bottle of water nearby and sent it into the bamboo wall where his caretaker stood. The water in the bottle splashed out onto the captain's face. The former wealthy hoodlum lunged forward and grabbed at the captain's shirt. He was seething with fury that the anger could have vapor from his pores and he yelled. So now you got an order to take me back and your hair to finish your job? What a good soldier you are. Then, let go of me. Fufa tried to stay calm to douse the younger man's furious fire, but it worked like throwing more oil into the flame. I'm not letting go of you. You're a jerk. A liar. The more he said, the fainter his voice became by the sobbing. Are you saying that what you've been doing is just lies? Thien closed his burning eyes as grief gripped his heart. He pressed his forehead against a broad, solid chest that had once protected him despite all that had happened as strength drained from his body. What's happening to us now? Captain Fufa stared at the slender form with a shattered heart. All he wanted to do was to make the younger man stay here. Yet, as he thought of the bright future lying ahead of Thien, his two rough hands that was weathered by hardship had to let the boy go. We are just too different. It was time to return the other man to his world. Fufa took in a deep breath, trying to summon strength to shield himself and protect his bleeding heart. You came here because of someone else, didn't you? The city boy looked up, his eyebrows knitted into a deep frown with an utter fear. Who are you talking about? The girl in the diary? Fufa glanced at the pastel diary that was taken out and put on the mattress. I know the truth. You don't have to lie anymore. How dare he rummage through my stuff? Thien violently pushed the other man away, his lips shaking, and hot tears sprung up from his reddened eyes. I never lied. But you never told me the truth either. What truth did you want? Thien yelled at the top of his lungs. The truth that Thorfinn was my heart donor? The truth that I got possessed by the idea to live in this hard place on the hill just like she did? Fuck! He punched at the bamboo wall, and the whole hut shook. He exploded because everything had gone downhill, and he couldn't salvage. The captain's intense dark eyes shone bright. He yanked the thin hand that punched the hut closer. 
Are you saying that a wealthy man like you just woke up one day with an urge to do something good for the poor? Don't make fun of yourself. Your game was over. Pack your bags and tomorrow Jad will take you to the bus station. The words cut right through his heart, sending the pang all over his chest. Yes, it had been a curiosity to see a world different than his at first. Then it was pure stubbornness to survive here. But everything he had been doing for this village, until this very moment, was from the tie he had developed with the place and the people, born at the bottom of his heart. If it wasn't such a bond, what else could it be? I'm leaving, but not tomorrow. He twisted his wrist free and wiped the snot at the tip of his nose with a determination. I felt sorry for Thorfinn, but she passed away in such a tragic accident. Her heart gave me a new life. If you've read her diary, you must have seen the last wish. Fufa's face darkened. You want to... But before he finished the word, the stubborn young man spoke up in a harsh voice. All I ask is five more days, from today until the end of the year. Thien glared into the captain's stern eyes. Your last duty is to wait for me there at midnight. He slapped against his left chest as if to stake his promise into the beating heart. And then I will take her away from here. Right at that moment, all of his senses seemed to die. If they said goodbye the next day, all he had to do was gashing at his heart for it to hurt just once. But to count the days until they parted ways was a slow, painful death. Fufa's lips tugged into a sad smile, feeling sorry for himself. What else could he do except to nod in agreement? So it shall be. Thien raised his chin, his face still bore bruises in defiance, and shouted, I don't want to see your face any longer. Get out of my sight. Captain Fufa pushed everything down and spun around, leaving without looking back. The sun was vanishing at the horizon near the mountain ridge, making the temperature drop to a bone-chilling degree. He kept walking like a soulless man before stopping at the old motorcycle he had parked near a tall tree. The officer slumped to his knees as all strength drained from his limbs. He stared at the hands that had wiped the tears from the boy's face, ones that he couldn't even lift up today. I want you to be here forever. His crackling deep voice was swept by the cold, merciless wind, for the way to reach that someone's heart had closed off in front of him. Later in the afternoon, Kama Bing Lei carried a stainless steel pinto to the volunteer teacher's hut, his face a picture of deep concern for the younger man. Thien didn't leave the house for two days. When he came to visit, he found the boy curling up under the blanket with a distressed look on his face. All he said was he hadn't been feeling well and he wanted a rest. He barely touched the meals cooked by the eldest wife. Bing Lei made up his mind that if Thien still didn't do better tomorrow, he'd take him downhill to see a doctor. And then all his doubt was answered when Jod, who was patrolling in the area, stopped to talk to him. He learned that the teacher would leave after the new year. But once he asked why he wouldn't complete his three-month term, there was no answer. Besides, Captain Fufa was nowhere to be found after the day he had been released from the hospital and come to the village in a hurry. Or perhaps they had a fight. Teacher? Bing Lei called in front of the hut. When there was no answer, he took the liberty to walk up the stairs and found shattering clothes all over the hut, with the younger man huddling his own knees in the middle. The older man put the food carrier on the floor as he crouched down and touched the thin shoulders. You better eat first while the food is still hot. I'm not hungry. Low, crackled voice came out from under the face that was hidden against the knees. 
Kama Bing Lei let out a long sigh and sat down next to the younger man. Physical wounds could be healed, but the mental one? How could one heal that? Jod told me everything. You have to leave after the new year. Time flies just like that, doesn't it? The end pressed his lips. What had been swimming around his head wasn't about returning to Bangkok, but that man's words who repeatedly stated that he had been given a strict order to keep an eye on him while he was here. All that the man had done didn't come from his own volition. All the warmth, the care and attentiveness he'd shown were mere duty. Fuck. It hurts more than a broken heart. The city boy looked up, his eyes swollen red, and turned towards the visitor who was looking at him, with worry. He forced out a smile. I've run away from home. Bing Lei's eyes widened with shock, but he quickly pushed it down and waited for the next words. The end shifted his focus from the man to the pastel diary that lied next to his backpack. My father was a deputy commander of the Thai military who was recently retired. When I left a letter before leaving, I was wondering why no one came after me. I've been trailed from the beginning. The memory of the first day he met the massive officer in front of the hut that night made his eyes hot. What he had been given wasn't freedom, just a short-term permission to taste the outside world. The end chuckled dryly at the cruelest joke. When things turned too bad, he just got another order to send me back. Kama Bing Lei held his breath for a millisecond as he realized who the he meant. As the village head, he had been watching the men from afar. They might have been in a verbal spars regularly, but never once they would be so upset with one another to the point of treating the other like he didn't exist. And yet, Captain Fufa's close watch on the younger man made him doubt for many times. He sensed that their relationship, even friendship, was solely based on duty. Even if that was an order, Captain has been worried for you, for real. Uncle Bing Lei hadn't been there with him that day. The man's cold voice and eyes void of emotions had been more real than anything else. I don't want to hear his name anymore. Beautiful eyes hardened and the older man felt exasperated. If he didn't feel anything, then why would he be this upset? All right, I won't mention his name. Bing Lei rubbed his face to relax. You haven't been outside for days, so you're not aware we're having a pre-New Year party. A party? As soon as he saw that he got the younger man's attention, the village head started explaining. Akka's New Year's Day is the swimming ceremony held in September. We decided to add three days and three nights celebration for the International New Year's Day, so the villagers who have been working hard all year round can take a rest from working in the field. He finished the sentence and opened the food container. My wife cooked for everyone, but she made this mild taste food f just for you since you're still not feeling well. The end looked at the plain soup with egg tofu and minced pork and the warm jasmine rice feeling overwhelmed. Thank you so much. He was touched by the older man's kindness, so he started eating, even if he wasn't feeling like it, swallowing the food down. Once the food hit an empty stomach, the enzyme gushed out to work. The end winced as he felt the burn all over his stomach. Finally, he succumbed to the force of nature, so he munched and finished all the food. Kama Bing Lei then invited him to the women's embrace yard, or the cultural yard in the middle of the village, to join in their revelry. You're running out of time. Please make the most of it. That was the elder's words that made Thien get up from the mattress to wash his face at the earthen jar behind the hut and feel refreshed again. The singing in unison with the lively rhythm of folk music could be heard from the distance. The yard was packed with people who were taking days off to rest 
and celebrate after the long, hard year. Young women were fully dressed in their best garments, wearing a hat with patterned metal plates hanging from the accessory, creating lovely chimes as they walked. They were dancing, moving their hands in a choreography that rhymes with their feet, creating a beautiful scene for the young men who were drinking, eating, and cheering on around them. The Hakka children who were running and playing came to a halt as they spotted their teacher standing still by the elder's side. They ran towards the young man who still looked exhausted. Let's go over there. We've got many food and snacks from the city. Miju pulled the teacher's hand to follow her to a large litter where many people stood by. Then glanced at the men in greenish khaki camouflage uniform among the locals, feeling dismayed as he saw the man wasn't there. The soldiers took snacks and canned drinks available in supermarkets and gave them to the kids as New Year presents according to the international calendar. The girl handed him a red can soda with a big smile. Be cram, drink this black water, it's good! The other children thronged in to hand some snacks to the teacher. Your beloved teacher, aren't you? A familiar deep voice spoke up right next to his ears, making the city boy jump. He spun around. Pidok Nam! The fair-skinned, slanted-eyes doctor moved his eyeglasses and grinned. What? Why did you jump like that? You thought I was the other person? No. Thien said harshly and opened the can of Coca-Cola to gulp it down and kill his frustration. All right, no is no then. The medical officer drawled as if he didn't believe any of it. Then his gait shifted. Can we find a spot to talk? The volunteer teacher looked away. If you want to talk about your best friend, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to talk about. But I do. Vasant grabbed and held tight on Thien's thin wrist. A lot to talk about. He stressed the words as he gazed into the light brown burning eyes. The young doctor made up his mind without waiting for an answer. He pulled the young man, who struggled a little, away from the crowd as Thien scowled. They came to a waterfall which was far away from the yard where the doctor asked him to sit down under a tree and put their feet in the water to relax instead of going straight to the point. Thien moved his legs up and down, stirring the water to disturb the minnows swimming in the basin till they hurried away. He then turned at the man next to him, losing his temper. Just spit it out, won't you? I took you here to cool your head. Guess it didn't work. The doctor let out a laugh, not caring if the other man was trying to bite off his head. Okay, before we start talking, can you tell me what you and Fu talked about that day that made things explode like this? He told me to go home. Is that it? He called me a liar. Said I came here just for fun, and if I stayed longer, it'd only give him more jobs. He had to take care of me even if he didn't want to. The city boy picked up a small rock and threw it away to vent his anger. Who's the real liar here? He was on my tail because of my father's specific order. He's such a good actor, deserving an Oscar. Yeah, true. He came so absorbed in the role that he's eating his own tears instead of food. Vassan deadpan, but his words made Thien glue his eyes on him. The doctor inhaled and looked up at the small birds flying over them in the sky. Captain Fufa is a man with firm resolution. Once he's made up his mind, he would take whatever comes his way, even if it hurts him to death. He will take it to himself. Yet I'm not surprised that Fu chose such an extreme measure. He looked back at the smooth, stunned face. If someone I care for the most has a bright future ahead of him, I'll do whatever it takes to push him away. To hold him back is a selfishness that will hurt the other because we live in such different worlds. 
Christian heard all the words loud and clear. His brain was laden with the information as he watched this cascade falling against a rock shelf for a moment before speaking up. He could have told me nicely. Why did he have to hurt me? His voice trailed off. It meant that he was certain. If he had begged you, you would have stayed here forever. Vasant stated matter-of-factly, making the other man's eyes widen with shock. The volunteer teacher started to shake as if he was stabbed right through the heart and all the hidden emotions were breaking free. No, I'm not. No. He blurted out his rejection, but the voice came out so faint that the mastermind man grinned. The doctor took a firm hold on the younger man's arm. Dian, you know too well how Fu is feeling about you. You don't have to pay attention what he said to make you upset, because those words were coming back to haunt and hurt him in the worst possible way. What's wrong with the captain? Dian asked, not wanting to admit that he was worried about the massive officer. Like a dead man, Rasant said grimly. If there's another attack from the goons, I'm sure he'll run into the bullets and die honorably in the battlefield. He's like a living dead anyway. He'd be better off dead. The doctor glanced at the younger man. Once he saw the shivering glint in the end's eyes, he launched another attack to the boy's weakest point. If you don't believe me, I'll take you to see with your own eyes. You can make up your mind later how you want to end this. The end didn't say another word as reasoning and his subconsciousness warred in his mind. At the end, he let Dr. Vassant pull him away one more time. This time they were heading towards the operating base, three kilometers away. Silence fell inside the official yeep that ran along a narrow road. Both men sat worldless in the front, making the ten-minute drive to the border operating base stretch awkwardly. Tien looked straight ahead in his passenger seat as if the view held his attention, and it was nothing but trees. His mind was in turmoil. On one hand, he told himself he shouldn't have come with the doctor. On the other hand, it wouldn't hurt to take a look at the captain. He wouldn't meet him face to face, so there was nothing to be afraid of. Dian, please let the security check on you. Dr. Vassant broke the silence, making the man who was gazing out the windshield jump. Yes. He turned towards the security. A soldier in a camouflage uniform with a loaded AK-47 stared at the visitors and looked into the vehicle. When he saw no weapons or hazardous substances, he saluted the doctor and allowed the car to go through. Hassan parked the jeep in the garage and took the teacher for a walk. The accommodation of the troops commanding officers stood at the far end, so it was more quiet than the one in the front where soldiers were walking in and out between the kitchen and the armory all the time. The orange evening sunlight bathed the sky, reflecting against the dark silhouette of the wooden house that stood on tall poles with an empty space underneath, casting a long shadow in the front. The wind swept coldness from the mountain top against a thin frame who was wearing only a jacket over his t-shirt, making Thien tremble. I'm leaving you here. I think Fu is bedridden as ever. The doctor said to the man who was rooted, stunned, at the foot of the stairs. You can wait here. I'm just taking a short look, and I'll come back down right away. I don't think it'll be that quick. I'll wait for you in the kitchen hall. Vasant shot the younger man a cunning grin and spun around, pacing away quickly before Thien could stop him. He didn't listen. Thien wanted to stomp his feet to let out his frustration. In the end, he looked up at the house in front of him with a heavy heart. After a moment of hesitation, he rubbed his face to muster his strength. All right then. Just a short sneak peek wouldn't kill a man. 
Tien tiptoed up the stairs until he crouched down to crawl at the door, which was left ajar. He poked it with a finger, pushed it open to create a small gap, and lowering his head to look inside. He scanned over the room until his eyes caught the sight of a tall form slumping on a narrow field bed. In front of the man stood a desk he dragged closer to put a bowl of hot pork porridge, a sick man's dinner. The officer became haggard. His cheekbones and jaws were even more prominent, looking more ashen than the last time he'd seen him. The sunken, intense, dark eyes had drained all of their liveliness as the man gazed at the wooden wall. His good left hand moved to pick up a spoon and scoop up the porridge, looking like a robot that was programmed to eat. Yet, the stainless steel spoon with the hot food fell from his hand hitting the desk with a loud clang. The man who was hiding closed his mouth, devastated. The man in the room only looked up, still unmoving and uncaring about his own reddened lips that got burned by the food. The young captain, who had been sick in both his body and mind, moved as if to pick up the spoon again, but he stopped in his track as he heard a door swing open. The volunteer teacher's slender form that he hadn't seen in days was coming up to him as the boy stomped his feet. He stopped and snatched the spoon with pieces of porridge before he could try eating again. The end dropped on the field bed next to him and scooped the food to blow the wind against it. Fufa gazed into the almond eyes that were glaring at him as the end blew the food to cool it down. A minute passed and he finally opened his mouth to take the food. The officer looked at the younger man who repeated the action with the food without saying a word, his heart filled with surprise and gladness. Yet as he realized that the other man was acting as someone, a pang shot right through his heart. It was usual for someone who had a near-death experience and a miraculous survival would be such susceptible. If that someone dodged a bullet by taking an organ from a donor, how much more susceptible he would be. Normally, the hospital kept organ donors' names top secret, so he was at the end of his wit how Thien would have found out. The diary that recorded everything its owner wrote down sent a young man with a bright future in front of him on a guilt trip that finally led him to abandon his luxurious life to live in this hard place. He was only trying to live for someone else, live in someone's place, until his real feelings became one with the other person. That was the reason why the impenetrable Captain Fufa was heartbroken, as if he couldn't fathom the real inner thought and being of the younger man after all this time. The city boy held the spoon when the thick, shapely lips wouldn't open to take the food. He glanced at the young captain, who merely stared at him and put down the spoon. I don't want to do this, but you're hurt because you helped me. I'm just trying to repay my debt. Thien forced out the words, yet, even if he was acting irritated, the tall man, who was motionless like a statue, didn't react until he was the one who got restless. Captain, it was supposed to be me who acted lifeless. You chased me away, and I learned that my family has been keeping eyes on me. That's right. Fufa's voice cracked as he spoke. You must be disappointed, but you're not hurt. Tien frowned deeply, his face twisted with frustration. Go on with your sarcasm. You wouldn't know what's on my mind anyway. The officer smiled humorously, with empty eyes void of emotions. You're right, I would never know. The younger man balled his hands into fists, trying to suppress his anger. He had just told the man he came here to repay him, not to start a fight. He changed the subject. You eat your food. I'll help you. As he reached out at the spoon, the older man shook his head. That's fine. I'm full. Why are you so stubborn? When will you be healed? 
shapely lips cocked in a dry smile, the kind that said he was feeling sorry for himself. I will never heal, Thien. Never. The younger man knew where the man was talking about that would never heal, but hearing it from an indestructible man who was crackling and crumbling down like this, his heart hurt as if being stabbed by a hundred knives. I can't take it any longer. Thien slapped on the canvas on the field bed and exploded all that he'd been pushing down. If you would be mean to me just to end up like this, why didn't you treat me better? You know I have to leave sooner or later. I just want to have good memories to keep with me always. Olman's eyes burned with wet tears as Thien gazed at the other man. Especially with you. Fufa was stunned. He lifted his good hand to cup the smooth cheek, wiping the tear at the end of the shapely eye away with his thumb as gently as the borderland soldier could. I'm sorry, he said faintly. I was shaken. Shaken? About me being an organ recipient from Thorfun? More shaken by the fact that you carry her diary with you. I know I did something wrong. The wealthy city boy spotted out. I shouldn't have looked for my organ donor. The young captain caressed the well-informed head covered by silken hair that touched the boy's cheeks. Then he said words that shook the other man to the core. It's all right. I just don't live in anyone else's place from now on. Tien's eyes widened. His breath stopped as his brain went black. He had read the diary repeatedly to appreciate the locals' kindness, the love and respect of the pupils, and the characteristics of the massive officer even before he traveled there. Did this mean that the entire bond that formed between them was born of Thorfinn's feelings? His conscience was bombarded with confusion. The tears that had dried sprung up once again like a broken dam on the ashen face. So, this life he was living belonged to Miss Thorfinn, the beautiful and gracious volunteer teacher, not to Thien, the looser rich guy who had never had any tangible in his life, not even the man right next to him. No, that's not true, he muttered like a man-man his whole body trembling with violent sobbings from the truth he couldn't accept. Fufa closed his eyes. His heart was gripped in an invisible claw that was crushing it. If he could, he would take all the pain from the other man and bear it all by himself. Yet, Thien would still be under the spell of the deceased girl. Even if it hurt like hell, this had to end now. The young captain took away the hand that was rubbing at the reddened eyes and gently wiped the boy's tears away. I feel as if my body and my heart are two separate beings, Thien said with a cracked voice. I don't know what to do next. Just go back to the beginning. Think why you came here. The city boy went silent, trying to piece all the shattering thoughts together until he finally found the answer. I came here to fulfill Thorfinn's last wish, the one she made on a star at the New Year's Eve, for she confessed her love to you on that cliff. Fufa took a deep breath. Finally, this dream was coming to an end. Do you know that pun didn't mean to share? It's from the Lana dialect that means a thousand. Fa pan dao. Thien repeated the name, taking in how powerful the name was. A legend said that if you stand on the cliff and count the stars in the sky until you reach a thousand stars, your wish will come true. Thin lips parted long before a voice came out. If I can do it, will I get a miracle? The officer smiled gently the handsome face painted with a hint of desperation and resignation. I have no idea. No one have ever achieved it till now. 
Kama Bing Lai's son, who came home during the New Year's holiday, went to see his friend who was a little older than him, who went through thick and thin together in a short time at the hut at the end of the village. He shouted Thien's name for a while, but didn't get any answers. He went to the woman's embrace yard where the adults hung out and drank. Long Tae walked around, looking for his friend, but he was nowhere to be seen. When he asked the guys if they knew where he was, someone told him the young city man had left for the north of the village since late morning. The north? Maybe he had headed to the waterfall. The young Aka man in a t-shirt and a pair of jeans, like city people, went towards the direction. If he couldn't find Thien there, he intended to return and wait for him at the hut. Once his father had told him that the teacher would be leaving after the new year, he was disappointed. Even if the other man was reckless and hot-headed, he was an honest man, a rare breed these days. The sound of a thundering cascade when the water hit the basin could be heard from the distance. Long Tae stopped and looked, finally spotting the man he had been looking for hunching on the ground, looking dejected and verily throwing small rocks into the water by the bank. He walked closer and called at him. Are you feeling well, B. Thien? You walk quite a distance. Thien looked up at the man who stood above him with sunken eyes from lack of sleep. Are you on a long weekend? Yes. Long Tae took the liberty to sit down cross-legged next to the other man. You look troubled. You don't want to go home to Bangkok? I didn't want to at first. Now I do. This means someone made you upset. The younger man teased, but the sad expression on the older friend's face made him shut up. He stole a glance at Tien not knowing what to say to make him feel better. If you trust me, you can talk to me. Tian reached out and slapped the boy's thick shoulder a few times. It's all right, I just don't feel like myself, that's it. How come you don't feel like yourself? If not yourself, who are you feeling like? The son of the village head asked innocently, but it made the other man go still. Let's say the city boy said faintly. What if our heart was replaced with someone else's? And that heart carries the last memories in it. You think that someone else's memory will take over us? Long Tae was speechless for a moment and let out a chuckle. Is this a sci-fi movie or something, bro? Think about it. How can a heart contain a memory? It's just an organ. Turning into someone else because you have the heart is a figment of your imagination. Imagination? Hearing an honest feedback from someone who didn't know about his operation, something became crystal clear. He had let the girl's story take over his mind and overwhelm his thoughts. If he thought of her as a dead woman, she would still be a dead woman. In retrospect, his curiosity had led him down the rabbit hole. It was his decision to come to this outback up on the hill. If he had chosen to let things slip by, even if he had found out about the donor, he'd still be the youngest son of his family, who would have been dining in some five-star restaurant or on a shopping spree in a luxurious mall in the city. He would have never experienced a true kindness from others like he was experiencing now. His face split into a wide smile that Long Tae felt goosebumps, fearing it was a sign of foreseeable trouble. Bro? You're sure you're okay? Thanks a lot, bro. What? Long Tae blurted out, bewildered by the city boy's mood swings. It's getting sunny here, let's move. Volunteer teacher changed the topic and asked the younger man to walk back to the village with him. The tall boy nodded in agreement, and something came to him as he rose to his feet. I forgot to tell you something. My dad asked me to go see him at the school at one. Thien looked at his wristwatch, seeing that it was half an hour to one. He asked the boy to accompany him to the school. 
Do you have any idea why the uncle wanted to see me there? I guess the supply from the foundation has arrived. Longte said and walked off, leaving the bewildered teacher behind as the end scratched his head. Never knew Thailand Post worked, even during a public holiday. They were such hard-working people, weren't they? The school on the cliff was completed. The only thing missing were a new blackboard, textbooks and other equipment that had been burned down in the fire. Once they neared the school, the teacher heard the laughter coming from the students who were running around. When he set foot in front of the school, he stopped in his track and so did his breath. Pieces of A4 papers with clear tapes were put together into a giant sign at the beam that stuck out from the school. Letters written by colored pens and painted by crayon smudges that skittered out from the frames would be read together in a phrase, Happy New Year. All of a sudden, the little pupils thronged out to throw their arm around his waist, shouting in unison, Happy New Year, in heavily accented Thai dialect. Yet the greetings echoed in his mind. Tian looked at Kama Bing Lei and his son who had big smiles plastered on their faces, and he knew who the mastermind was. Long Tae cupped his hand around his mouth, whispering, Surprise! The city boy glared back to hide his embarrassment. Miju and Aji, Daka's sister and older brother, took the teacher's hand towards the mat that acted as a desk. Assortment of snacks were laid out on the mat from canned crackers to cookies and sodas. It reminded Thien of a New Year party when he was in elementary school. Be crayon! We got that too! Miju was especially thrilled looking at the big piece of dessert with chocolate cream on top and strawberry jam decoration in the middle. Thien smiled at the girl's innocent before telling her, That's a cake. C-A-K-E. The kids recited the word in unison, making the teacher's heart swell with pride. Once he told they could start eating the snacks, they all jumped in. He backed away towards the two men who stood nearby. You like it, bro? Dad told me to take him to the city and buy the snacks and a cake for the party. Long Tae explained how they got to have this small yet warm party. I saw that you were feeling down. I imagined the city people like to throw big parties. But for outback people like us, this is the best thing we could give you. Once he finished the sentence, Bing Lai's hands shot up to answer the why from the younger man. Thank you so much, uncle. It wasn't the prices of things that counted, it was the effort that did. This is the best party I ever had in my life. Thien didn't lie. Not a party in a five-star hotel could have given him such contentment like this one. The volunteer teacher crouched down and used a big kitchen knife to cut the chocolate cake into pieces as his students surrounded him with expectant bright eyes. They didn't have forks, so they took a piece by hand, uncaring of germs. Dien munched on the dessert that tasted almost blandly, but his value was incomparable in his heart contented. He glanced at the younger friend who was suckling on the soda, suddenly feeling an urge to tease at him. He cleared his throat to call the younger boy's attention. You know what? We city people do have some norms for our parties. What about them? Long Tae asked, curious. The end's lips split into a sinister grin as the prey was ensnared. Like this. He scooped the chocolate cream with one finger and smeared it on the younger man's cheek, bursting into a laugh. The other man was frozen, shocked. This wasn't a norm, but a personal revenge. The kids saw what happened and ran towards the teacher to swarm him. How dare you! The end shot up to his feet and chased after the kids. The bellow of laughter rang loud in the small school. Even Kama Bing Lei, who stood by, became a casualty of cream war. The teacher's handsome, fair face was smeared with cream, 
and yet he was smiling widely. There would be no other chances he could have this moment with the Akka kids, so this was the moment he had to weep and cherish as much as possible so he could have something to remember as he said goodbye. And yet, he didn't have the heart to say goodbye now. The kerosene lamp glowed softly inside the tiny hut. Clothes that had been hung to dry on the window frames and the terrace were gone, like the ones that scattered on the floor were. The expensive backpack was stuffed fuller than the first day he'd arrived there. The rectangular mosquito net was still covering the body that lied face down in the middle of the hut. The end supported himself on his elbows on the old mattress as he focused on reading a diary. After I came here, I discovered another dream apart from being a teacher for the hill tribe. The prince I found had transformed my world from a colorless one to the most beautiful one. He's warm and kind, but he just likes to wear a scowl on his face. Yet that can't wipe away his gentleness. The end's thin lips cocked into a light smile. The captain was a gentleman who liked men. One day I heard a villager who speaks some Thai say that if you stand on the highest cliff at the midnight and make a wish, it will come true. It seems impossible, but what can a hopeless girl like I do? If I confess my love to my prince among the hundreds and thousands of stars in the New Year's night, that will be such a romantic evening. So after I've come to Bangkok and seen my father who's sick with alcoholism, I'll give it a try, even if it might sound crazy. So please wait for me, my beloved prince. The ink trail stopped right there, forever. The girl got it a bit wrong. She had to stand there on the cliff and count a thousand stars to be able to make a wish. He had asked Long Tai to confirm the legend. The boy had laughed and said it was just some made-up urban legend to lure people to enjoy the night view on the hill, much like a background story that was created to attract customers. The end didn't know if it was a made-up story or a real legend. Perhaps this was the only thing he agreed with Thorfinn, that a hopeless person would always look for a miracle. The volunteer teacher closed the diary. It was a quiet, lonely night that even Cricket's sounds became silent. He picked his down jacket to put on before putting out the light. Sien grabbed the flashlight near the mattress and walked down the stairs. The small road in the village was lit by torches. Once he left the vicinity, he had to depend on the flashlight. He rarely came to this cliff mostly with the kids to play games, yet he remembered the way. If he walked along the tea plantation route towards east, he would find a slope that led towards the upper cliff. Even if he was surrounded by forest, he wasn't feeling frightened. It was a sparse forest with tall and small trees that made one feel comfortable. The fragrance of sweet osmanthus around him made him more refreshed. It was exactly 11.30 p.m. He intended to come before the appointed time, because he wanted to count a thousand stars. It wasn't a challenging number to accomplish, yet he didn't want to tempt fate. If it was easy, someone would have done it a long time ago. Once he showed up from the canopy of the last tree, he saw a vast open yard. The end stopped in his tracks, for a moment before lurking forward to stand in the middle of the open space, spinning around and looking up at the waves of glittering stars in the dark curtain of the night sky, astounded by the moonless beauty. This was what they called the Sea of Stars. His heart fluttered, trembled by a sudden fear that shot through his body and made his limbs go limp. The stars were so beautiful that this place should be registered as a national tourist attraction. Yet, the density of lights that made it impossible to count the stars from one another was frightening. 
Tien looked down at the ground to adjust his eyesight, taking a deep breath to summon his courage. The smooth face looked up again at the sky as he pointed his index finger to count the stars one by one. One hundred, two hundreds, three hundreds. Then his eyes got blurred. He needed throbbing eye sockets and moved to the other end of the yard where more stars seemed to scatter more. The typical counting turned into sectioning as the cliff was so high that the sky seemed to be so close one could reach out for it. The shimmering lights of hundred thousands of stars were brighter than usual that they made his sight become hazy and light sensitive. The city boy shook his head, feeling nauseous from a headache. He slumped down to rest his eyes in the middle of the quiet night as his confidence waned. He had counted five hundred stars, and everything became blinding white. He balled his fist and punched the ground to let out his frustration. Shit! A thousand. He just had to count a thousand stars. If he couldn't do it, then he would be a loser. He took in a deep breath to cheer himself up once again and stood up. Reality is always cruel. Only willpower won't do. The man who tried to challenge a man's limit thought of a new method. He turned around in 80 degrees. He turned around in 180 degrees, counting the stars until his eyes got tired before turning towards the other direction in order not to repeat the same stars. A thought flashed in his mind that what he was doing was an utter nonsense and pure stupidity. Yet his stubbornness always spiked up the chart whenever he was challenged with a failure. This way worked best. His counts got higher now as he reached eight hundreds. The city boy turned the other way and pointed his finger at the sky, elated. And yet, he couldn't keep it up for so long. The bright lights above hurt his eyes until they became painful. His head was spinning and he wanted to throw up, but he went on. 955 956 As he turned the other way, he almost fell down and the scene before him nearly turned white. He slapped his own cheeks to gather his will before lifting a finger to start counting. Yet, the sections he had calculated in his head just didn't show up. All the hundred thousand stars had gathered and formed a sparkling arch in the night sky. Tien was breathing heavily as he saw success vanish before his eyes. He let out a maddening laugh. His shaking fingers still counted the stars, even if he knew well that it was in vain. 997 998 Brown eyes gazed aimlessly, warm wet tears sprung up and made everything dim as he was no longer unable to focus. Still, he kept his feet rooted on the spot and went on counting. 999 All of a sudden, things went black. Warm palms that were closing on his eyes made his nostrils hot like a coal. A low whispering near his ears was comforting. You can stop. The young captain was plastered against the boy's back, and his shadow cast over at the ends like a shield against a cold breeze. Tears of disappointment and sorrow gushed out through the rough fingers till the officer's hands got wet. I couldn't make it, even for this one last try. Tien bit his lips till they bled, unable to hold back a sob any longer. Even if he could have made it, his wish would never come true anyway. Fufa's intense eyes softened with sadness. He said gently, You've done your best. I didn't do it for Torfan. She's dead. The city boy shouted so the whole forest and the man would know. I did it for myself. He spun back to face the other man. Even if his face was wet with tears, Tien's face was a picture of strength. 
I don't want to leave this place. I don't want to leave you. Before the captain could answer, he tensed up as the younger man tiptoed and kissed him in a violent kiss, befitting the vehement love confession. Thien kept his lips pressed against the officers for a long while before withdrawing, his thin hand still wrapped tightly around the strong neck as he laid his head on his thick shoulders. Even if it all started because of Thorfinn, but all of the feelings I have belong to me. The voice was indistinct with sobbing, but the words were like blessing that flooded into the captain. Fufa lifted his good arm and embraced the slender form, holding him tight. He lovingly pressed his nose on the soft, fragrant hair. And this is my feeling. I'll protect you with all of my heart. Thien smiled in tears. Why was the happiness he'd been searching for so ephemeral? He wanted to stop time right here so things stood still leaving all of the rules and the reasons, living without having to think about anyone else. He clutched the camouflage jacket until it crumpled, for he knew too well what he had in mind was impossible to reach. If I'm away, will you forget about me? I will never forget you. Never. The young captain pressed his cheek against the smooth cheek closing his eyes to take in every feeling that was transpiring between them. It took him a long moment before he could utter another word. But once you've returned to where you belong, just forget about me. The younger man's eyes shot open as he backed away. Why would you say that? There are others who are better for you, with the right social status and everything. The officer smiled tightly as his eyes dimmed. He pointed towards the sky. You see the stars? Even if a mountain is unbeatable and tall, it can't reach the horizon. How can I reach you, then? The end was struck still. All of the words got stuck in his throat. He had fought hard to escape death, but he was losing in this moment. The rascal who had once led a gang rubbed his eyes as tears gushed out. He would have stomped his feet if he could. I will never forget you. Never. Fufa shook his head in an adored exasperation. He wound his left arm around the shapely head and kissed Thien's forehead to comfort his petulant boy. The dark, intense eyes filled the tears slowly closed as his lips parted to say, let time be our proof, then. Thien threw his arm around the solid body into a tight embrace as a promise. Even if the night was freezing cold, their impenetrable bond was spreading its heat all over their bodies and hearts. If our love can stand the test of time until that day, I'll be waiting for you right here. Dawn came too early. It was in the blink of an eye when one had to wake up and face the truth that the dream had come to an end. The volunteer teacher put down his pastel diary in the backpack and sipped up all the memory to seal it at the deepest pit. He took in a deep breath, turned to look at the small hut that had sheltered him for the past three months with a deep sorrow. Pithian, someone came for you. A call from the son of the village head woke him up from his reverie. He grabbed the sporty backpack and stepped out of the door. The morning cold breeze came with a cock-a-doodle-doo in the distance. Not far away, the Aka father and son were waiting for him with kind smiles on their faces like it had always been. He couldn't help feeling like something was already missing in his heart as he wouldn't be able to see these unpretentious, honest smiles anymore. Is Jod here? Thien asked, since Kamaping Lei had told him earlier that the military would send Jod and Ayip to take him to the bus station downtown. Jod couldn't make it. It was someone else. The word someone else made his heart thrum. Could it be... When a man showed up behind him, he blurted out with a genuine surprise. 
Pite? The fair-skinned, Chinese-looking, soon-to-be doctor opened his arm for his brother from another mother, who lurched at him and hugged him like a little boy. He ruffled the boy's hair with an exasperated adoration. You little rascal! You ran away without telling anyone! Did you know how much chaos it was at home? I'm sorry, bro. I couldn't find any other way to do it. The end backed away and scratched his neck in embarrassment. He stopped acting like a kid around the older man since he became a junior high school student, but the long absence made him forget his manner. How come did you get here, though? You came to take me home? Once I heard about it, I asked for a leave. My dad's guy drove me here. You didn't have to bother. Even if it was a statement that showed etiquette of the speaker, it still took someone who had known Tian all his life like Tai Chin aback. He smiled gently. I wanted to come here. It didn't bother me at all. Your eyes are hollowed like a panda and you said you're fine? The city boy shrugged as he started walking. So perhaps we can stop by for lunch in the city. Once again, the future doctor frowned as he weighed in on the younger man as he looked at his thin back. He looked physically fine, but something in him had changed. He turned back to look at the Aka village head and his son before lifting his hand into a vai. Thank you for taking care of my little brother while he was here. I should be the one who thank you for letting him come here. Kama Bing Lei said as a man who'd seen the world. We received so much from Ku Tian during the past two months, especially his sincerity. Tai Chin nodded in acknowledgement. In fact, he couldn't picture how a wealthy boy with a silver spoon could have lived such a hard life, waking up at dawn to teach hill tribe children. The men walked together until they reached a slope that led from the village to the main road with a car waiting. Tian said goodbye to both the Akas. Uncle, Longte, goodbye. Please tell everyone and the kids that if we've got a chance, we will meet again. I think you'd better tell them yourself. As Tian wanted to whip around and scold at Longte for his nuisance response, he heard tiny voices ring out in unison. Pea crayon! The city boy dropped his backpack to the ground, stunned. He dropped to the ground as his little pupils thronged in to hug him with tears and sobbing. The villagers who came to say goodbye to their volunteer teacher stood by, talking in a local dialect that couldn't be translated, yet could be felt by heart. Goodbye, and we'll see each other again. Taichin looked at the petulant younger man, who was like his younger brother, giving a loving comfort to a little girl who was bursting into tears as he caressed the children's hair to calm their sorrow. He was speechless as some emotions welled in him and burned his eyes. Then didn't just change, he transformed. The future doctor picked up his phone to record the scene that would be imprinted in someone's mind. No matter how far ahead the road lied ahead of Tian, he didn't want the boy to forget this day and the cherished memories he had. As he lowered his phone, he said to the man next to him, I got what you mean now. Kama Bing Lei chuckled lowly and patted the medical student's doctor's solid shoulder. This is a true reward that can only be won by a heart. The city man took off his glasses to wipe the tears in his eyes. I was angry at first how Thien made his mom worried she felt ill. Now I'm just glad he decided to do this. It must have been fate or coincidence that made someone grow up physically and mentally. He had once objected to the general, who was his father's friend, for letting his youngest son face the hardship alone on the hills, despite his fragile physical condition. But here, seeing the once baby boy turn into someone who did something for others and was receiving so much love in return, he wanted to kick himself for underestimating the younger man. The volunteer teacher looked around for a man he'd waited for, 
but what he found was disappointment. You really want me to forget you, don't you? He waved to everyone with reddened eyes, trying his best not to burst the dam of emotions in front of the kids. So he grabbed Taichin's hand and dragged the man away as if he couldn't bear being here for another second. An expensive silvery sedan parked on the shoulder of the dirt road. Once a soldier spotted them emerging on the narrow slope, he hurriedly opened the car's door in the back for them. Taichin glanced at the man who was silent since they left the village. He gently said, It's all right if you want to cry. Let it out. The younger man sniffed and took in a deep breath, shaking his head slowly. No, I've done enough crying. He had cried last night when he had said goodbye to the man until he fell asleep. The warmth from the rough, gentle hand still lingered on his skin. This must be one of the lessons he still had to learn, that no matter how many tears you shed, there was something that couldn't be recalled. Weren't you surprised that no one was coming for you? The future doctor asked to change the subject and lighten up the younger man's mood. I was, but I didn't want to look for the answer. It was good for me that way. Taichin's lips tugged into a light smile as he heard the answer that befitted an old version of the boy he knew. Your lady mom was throwing major tantrums. Your father had to insist that it was for the best that you faced the outside world, otherwise you'd be caught and dragged home the first day you set foot here. I kind of guessed who the whistleblower was. It was only Tull who knew about his plan, and he was the last man seen with him before he ran. It wasn't like your father was all right. He ordered my dad to find someone to watch over you right away. How was he, though? Did he take good care of you? Dian looked at the window to hide the dregs that lied at the bottom of his heart. Yes, he was a big help. So big he wouldn't be able to find anyone who could give him this much. You still haven't told me why you ran away to be a volunteer teacher. Teaching couldn't figure out, no matter how hard he tried to crack the puzzle, of what had inspired the younger man. Tien glanced at him briefly and whispered, I thought you already knew. If you meant the organ donor, yes, I did know about her. What I didn't know is what's going on in your head. I... Tian held his breath before saying, I got tired, tired of everything. I couldn't find what the true meaning of happiness in life is, so I thought if I tried something new, maybe I would find the answer. The future doctor frowned at the words. How come a man who was born with a silver spoon and had everything handed to him since the day he came into the world say he wasn't happy? You think you found it? The light in the almond eyes dimmed immediately and rendered the older man speechless. No, I haven't. I didn't even get to know it well before having to say goodbye. Was he talking about the villagers and the children? Teichin ran his hand down his face and looked outside the window, not wanting to probe deeper into the younger man's fragile emotions. Two hours later, the luxurious sedan was parking in the city for a breakfast. Then they were heading towards the destination, Bangkok. The drive was silent and lonely, with only soft talks once in a while. They both were tired from what they had gone through as individuals. Tian snuggled up in a soft duvet that Teichin had brought him. He had a long nap, as if to stay in a dream, or not having to wake up again. But time never stood still. Finally, the car was stopping in front of the mansion after a ten-hour journey. The man who got roused opened the car door, still sleeping, until a warm embrace woke him up. My boy! Lady Lalita had waited for this day for a whole three months. Every passing day, she had been anxious how her youngest son feared. Grief would have killed her hadn't the colonel, her husband, right-hand man, given them constant reports on their son's well-being. Mom, 
A mother's gentlest touch warmed up the end's heart. He took her plump body into his embrace and teased her. You lost weight. Lady Lolita pulled back and slapped her son's forearm. I'm going to smack you! You ran away and now you're teasing me? The boy whined loudly, amused. But as he looked into his mother's red eyes, he was overwhelmed with guilt. Tien lifted his hand to press together in a vi and gently put them on her shoulder. I'm sorry, Mom. Lady Lalita was taken aback, stupefied by her boy's genuine action. As Tien had reached his puberty, he had always been attached and influenced by his friends or girlfriends and became more distant from his parents. He had always acted as if showing love, affection and gratitude towards his mom and dad meant the sign of weakness. Even if she knew how it was with teens, no parents would want that. Tears welled up in her eyes as she caressed his hair, feeling proud. It's okay, my love. I'm glad you came home safe and sound. She cupped his face in two hands, taking in how his skin was slightly darkened. Then her eyes caught the faint bruises on his cheekbones and the corners of his lips. Look at you! What have you done to your pretty face? I give you my word that I will not stop you from doing what you want from now on. Wherever you want to do, whoever you want to hang out with, you can do it. All I ask is one thing. Please do not risk your life on the hill ever again. A mother's decree made Thien hold his breath. He looked away, unable to say yes, but he didn't resist either. Luckily that his mom was deep in her concern she didn't catch on his small, indistinguishable reaction. Then his eyes caught the sight of his father, who stood slightly in the back. Dad, I... The former general smiled gently, knowing well the words his son was telling him through his eyes. He walked in to tap the thin shoulders a few times before whispering. We'll talk later. Just go and make your mom feel better. Tien nodded, swallowing all the words that got stuck in his throat and let his mom pull him into the house. The light from the living room chandelier blared his eyes. The barak cushion with gold rims and the bone china from the Ming dynasty were sparkling in the lights reflecting extravagance. He looked around the familiar mansion that became foreign to him, letting out a long sigh. What a different world this is. But this was his world.